access the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845, and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. Hey, Green Lantern fans, welcome to episode number 225 of the podcast of OA. I'm Myron Rumsey, and I'm joined by my good friend, Phil Bova. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about the new number one issue of Green Lantern of the Jeremy Adams run. And I'm really excited to talk about this one. I don't know about you, Phil. I'm excited. I'm excited. It seems like a new energy has entered the atmosphere with Green Lantern lately with Adams coming on. And you know what? I'm going to ride along that train and be happy about it. That's right. It's like it's like a wave. Like we're yeah. we're, we're emerald surfers and we're catching on a new wave. Uh, yeah. This. Uh, you know, I I said it to Jeremy Adams during our interview back in podcast of Voa episode two twenty two. Which if you haven't listened to it or watched it, you should because it was a great interview with Jeremy Adams. But I told my I, I felt like I had come home again. Yeah. That this feels very familiar. Uh, not only to the Johns run, it feels familiar to classic Green Lantern. Uh, you know, it is a setup issue, you know, let's, let's not circle around that. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely a setup issue, but there's a lot in here to like in this issue. I, I, I thoroughly loved it. There's a couple of things, which I, you know, I have, I have a few pet peeves with the green lantern and one of them being the white boots, one of them being the ring missing around the wrong hand and the other is Hal's eyes. And, um, and it's, it's funny. Cause if you go back, to the Silver Age, there were times when Hal's eyes were blue, but they settled on brown, and here they're blue again. So it's interesting. It's interesting. It, it could be an artistic choice. Not that his eye color is is tantamount to what his character is, right? But it depends. If you're a fan, you know, you want to maintain some levity of control over over the character. You know, you want to keep it at least consistent. <laughs> true. Very true. Very true. Uh, but but I really. I, I, I got a good feeling from this. I got, got good vibes, both from the Jeremy Adams part of the book and from the Philip Kennedy Johnson part of the book. And again, referring back to another episode, if you didn't listen or watch episode 223, where we interviewed Philip Kennedy Johnson, again, uh, another interview worth going back and listening to or watching, as well as the one that our friends over at the Lantern Cast did, because they interviewed Philip Kennedy Johnson as well. So, you know, we've between between the Lantern Cast and, and the podcast of Oh, we've got you covered. Yeah, and it's good that they're promoting their books. I mean, you know, it was it was flattering to be re, uh, to get in contact with them guys, and you know, and to be able to talk to Adams and and Johnson, you know, and it kind of to me goes to show the lengths they'll go to to fandom, especially coming over to the podcasting side of it, you know, and getting Lantern Cast and getting us and and Donnie and you know, and talking to all of us that that lead that that lead the charge and and where the rings go and. I mean, it's flattering enough to say that we're kind of a voice for some kind of a, the general public, you know, when it comes to social media and stuff. And, you know, and I think each, each of us has a little piece of the pie and it's kind of it's yeah. kind of and it's kind of cool to be to be regarded that way because fans are important, you know, and, and you can you can make as much money as you want. But at the end of the day, you know, fans hold the control about how much money you're going to make. So and be careful with how you treat them. Well, one of the things that I find refreshing is that both Adams and Johnson are very fan friendly. You know, they're they're yeah. they're engaging with fans. Uh, that's something that's they, they're engaging with fans in a positive manner. Let me put it that way, uh, which has not always been the case. So, uh, very very nice, very refreshing to see that as well. That these are creators that not only are interested in talking to fans, but want to talk to fans. Yeah. You know, that, that I think it says a lot about the quality of the people that are writing the books. Uh, and, and that's something I don't think we've felt in a while. So I'm, I'm really, I, I'm very enthusiastic. Uh, you know, I've, I've said it before. I I'm more enthusiastic now than I have been in, in quite some time. So I'm ready to ride that Emerald wave, man. I'm going to get it done. All right. Well, there's not a whole lot of Green Lantern news because we just recorded last week. Nothing really has, has changed. So there's really nothing new there uh, other than to say that the, uh, Martin Nodell website store did open. It opened with the release of the last episode. And there is some really cool stuff over there. They, they've got some prints and they actually have a few items that were signed by Martin Nodell before he passed. So this is really one of the last opportunities to get Martin Nodell artwork 
and a signature from someone who's no longer around is, you know, and you're supporting the family, which, which is a big thing to me. I bought some stuff from him, you know, and, you know, of course, that, oh, no, we'll just go ahead. No, you're not going to just go ahead and do nothing. You're going to let me buy some stuff from your people. You know, I got to support this, too. And <clears throat> and I'll tell you what, I mean, Marty did some great stuff back in the day. And it's fascinating to know what those guys. It, it, it's fascinating the circles that those guys were involved with back in the time, because we regard them as heroes now. I mean, look at Stanley and look how far he's come. I mean, he's a he's a cultural icon for for everybody these days and back in the back in those times i mean yeah he was known but not to the, the celebrity status they are now but um marty had some great stuff and he did a lot of great work uh back in his time and uh he he should be regarded as such uh it, along with the other greats uh in the pantheon of of writers and artists that have come along very true very true so with all that out of the way let's jump into new your course segment and then let's jump right into this new book because I'm itching to talk about it. This is Salak, Green Lantern of Sector 1418, and you are receiving the podcast of Oa. The podcast of Oa. Welcome back, fellow Owens, to another Know Your Core segment. This week, we have a core member named Fintara Rob, Arisia's father, member of the Green Lantern Corps. Sector 2815, Fintara Rob was created by Mike Barr and Len Wine. First appearance, Tales of the Green Lantern Corps, number one, May 1981. Appearance of Death, Blackest Night, Tales of the Corps, number three, September 2009. Ventura Rob was a Graxonite from the planet Graxos 4. He served as an officer in the Green Lantern Corps and operated out of Sector 2815. His teenage daughter, Arisia, later assumed her father's duties as Green Lantern. And there you have it, fellow Owens, another cool member of the Know Your Corps segment. This is Giancarlo Volpe, producer of Green Lantern, the animated series, and you're listening to the podcast of Oa. All right, fellow Owens, welcome back to the podcast of Oa. Uh, Interesting fun fact about Fintar Rob and Arishia Rob. Their last name is Mike Barr's last name in reverse. Think about that. And you know, now that you mention it, spot on. Go you, man. So anyway, got an exciting book to talk about. First issue, written by Jeremy Adams, art by Zermonico, colors by Romelu Fajardo Jr., letters by Dave Sharp. The backup of the John Stewart story is written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Montos, colors by Adriano Lucas, and letters also by Dave Sharp. So interesting book. It starts out with a story that it, it start, it, there, there's time jumps in this issue. So if there's any confusion for folks, I think that's where it may come from because we do jump back and forth a couple of times in the Hal story. And then we jump in time as well uh, in the John Stewart story. So it you have to really be sure you're paying attention, but it starts out with some miners that are in coast city. They're, they're trapped underground and Hal comes to the rescue. And that's when coast city learns that green lantern is back. And Coast City learns about Hal Jordan and Green Lantern being back at the same time that Carol Ferris does. And Carol's reaction is a little different than, than the miners. Yeah, it kind of it's that it's not a surprising uh reaction when she sees them on TV. <laughs> well, what, what, what's interesting to me is is we 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 definitely get the impression right away that Hal has been away from Earth for a while, but yet in the comics and continuity. Hal was on Earth for the entirety of the previous run. (laughs) So obviously with Dawn of DC, some time has passed. Some things have been going on that that were really, it's not that important to know. But if you're really a continuity freak, you just have to realize some things have changed and time has passed. Mm -hmm. Hal has been off off Earth for some time. Carol, as we learn, has moved on. In fact, the world has moved on. But when Hal comes back, he's not quite... Um, I'm not sure what the right choice of words is, but 
time in his mind hasn't passed at all for him. And there are some things that have changed that he's really not comfortable with yet. Displaced. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a very good choice of words. He's yeah. been displaced socially, professionally. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and there's a nice little one pager that kind of outlines a few things that have happened that, that they give us some exposition on without having to write it in the book. And that is after the last run, the United, the, the United planets, I almost say the United Federation of planets there, the United planets have taken over our sector of space as well as, you know, they, they were coming to power uh, they've quarantined our sector for whatever reason. All the Earth lanterns have been assigned to different sectors other than Earth. Uh, Earth and, and all of our sectors quarantined completely uh, because we're some sort of a liability, not just us, but the entire sector. Yeah. And Hal has basically told the United Planets what they can do with the rings. And he's back on Earth completely powerless although we do see here in the beginning that it looks like he's got a ring we get more about that as it goes on but uh you now obviously some things have changed a uh, lot that, has changed oh yes you're you're very right but carol not too thrilled to see that hal is back in fact she's trying to get out of there because she knows he's going to be showing up any minute now she leaves ferris air and there he is and and you can kind of see hal is trying to pick up right where he left off it's almost the, like he's just standing there waiting to like step right into the store, step right, right into a right. thousand page book on page 500 and think you're just going to get right on. Right. Not right. The way it works. Man. And, and, and yeah, it doesn't work the way. And it was interesting when we talked with Jeremy Adams, one of the things he talked about was he doesn't know exactly what he's going to do with Hal and Carol. He hasn't mapped all that out. He just knows, you know, he referred to Carol as home. Carol is home for Hal. So Hal and this, the sense of uncertainty about where he is. And we see more about that later in a flashback. He's looking for security and safety because he doesn't have it anywhere else in his life. And so he's, he's perhaps pushing a little harder than he should to try to go back to the status quo. And thinking about this in terms of comic book storytelling, the last time we saw Carol Ferris was during the Morrison run where she appeared in a couple of issues. Uh, that was where the Carol Ferris of another well, it's Hal Ferris, I think, of another of another planet, uh, interacted with mm -hmm. Carol and Hal, and there was another version of Hal Ferris involved in all of this. But when we saw Hal and Carol, Hal had flown back to Co City and was in the midst of a proposal. Right, that he was proposing to Carol when that gets interrupted, and we know previous to that, the, the previous time she'd been seen was at the end of the Robert Venditti, Hal Jordan, and the Green Lantern Corps series, where the two were embracing with each other. So. Certainly some things have taken place since then when it comes to their relationship. She's got a boyfriend. She's moved on. Hal is, of course, kind of that being that alpha male and that, well, you know, is it anybody I know? And how can I get a shot in here to, to get you back? It's not exactly the most subtle way of going about it. But I think it's a lot driven by this sense of where do I fit now? And not really having a good way of, of expressing himself yeah i was, I was going to say that this seems like i don't know i mean i'm not i don't know how as a personal character but how he's been written this just seems like the kind of approach he would take not because i mean he's he's old guard right so it his yeah. methods and his, and his his methods and his charms i mean if you want to stay true to the character really wouldn't change that much so his approach at this at this time just walking back into Carol's life and being smug about it and being nonchalant and joking about it. Well, I mean, that also goes to show the level of maturity he has towards the relationship with him and Carol. Mm -hmm. and, and we've talked about, you know, we did a whole yeah. episode where we kind of dissected the relationship history True. and it's, it's always on and off again. And I've always, I've always said when it comes to Hal and Carol, uh, the having is not as good as the wanting. Mm. And, and that's true. Yeah. And, and, you know, in the back of your mind that she and her boyfriend are going to end up big splitting up and they're going to get back together again somewhere down the road. Maybe not in this run. Who knows? Maybe this is is the call that puts Hal on a different road. You know, maybe we see Cowgirl come back. Who knows? Uh, it, it's certainly left open, but I can see where some people would read this and think that Hal is being a bit of an ass. Sure. 
I, I could easily read it that way. I, I didn't read it that way, but I can see where people could easily read it that right. way. Sure. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yep. And, and then the other thing we find out is that Hal's not the only one who's on Earth uh, from outer space. Sinestro was here as well. Very undercover. <laughs> like he's right. in a bar and uh, how people don't recognize he's got or, got pink orange, or pink skin. I don't know, but they don't. Especially because they had to order a, either at the bar or the guy brought it to him. Right, right, right. <laughs> what, what do you, what do you think Sinestro got to eat? Uh, to, is he eating or is he just drinking over there? I, well, they don't really tell us. He's he's there, and all you really see is a glass. But it looks like a napkin stand is there too. So I'm gonna go with a pomegranate martini. Yeah. Do you think he ordered any food? What do you think he ordered? Chicken wings. Chicken wings. <laughs> I I was going with a burger, but I could see him doing chicken wings <laughs> or fajitas. He might have been going for fajitas. You could start a whole podcast on what would superheroes eat, you know, <laughs> you know, just do a thing where it's like two guys walk into a bar. You know, it's Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne. They sit down and have lunch. What are they eating today? <laughs> well, Clark is having apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, any, anyway, Sinestro is there. We we don't know exactly what's going on, but we do know by the way the book is being solicited that Sinestro is somehow responsible for something that's happened. Don't know what it is. And, and who knows, that could just be somebody writing solicitations trying to make it look interesting but uh no doubt sinestro is back in there and there's going to be some interactions and then we get the time switch and we go back a month hal's on earth hal is making up a conversation with kilowog in his head he's by himself out in his brother's trailer out in the middle of the nowhere watching the stars and having a soda pop and uh he's he's making up a conversation with kilowog and he's questioning you know, boy, I really did it this time. You know, this is, this is, you know, I, I went someplace where I had friends and a family and a job and a purpose. And, you know, you really showed them, didn't you, Hal, is is what he says. I told those planet, United Planets what they could do with the rings if they decided to quarantine our home world. And now here we are. You're stuck. You're right out in the middle of nowhere, hiding out. You've got no money. You've got no job, no prospects. No Carol. No Carol. No, and at this point, he hasn't even done that yet. At this point, he's sitting there. Oh, that's right. That's true. This is yep. the month before that, right? Yep. This is the month before that. But the <laughs> one thing, the one thing that stands out is there are several shots where you see Hal's right hand. He's got no ring. Okay, so this brings up the whole. All right, so Greenland, Hal Jordan's ring has been a manifestation. The last we know of Hal Jordan's ring has been a manifestation of his own will, right? Well, he had the ring that he forged back during the Hal Jordan and the Green, Green Lantern Corps book, but then he lost his ring again, remember, during the, the finale to sure. the last run, and he was able to manifest one from Will without trying too awful hard. So hmm. here we are, United Planets must have taken the ring back, or he's got it hidden somewhere and he's just not wearing it because there's no way to charge it. Could be either I way. I would venture to guess they would have taken that ring back that he made. And if this is the case here, yeah. then he's just the manifestation of will itself. Yeah. I, that's the impression I get is that, is that he doesn't have the ring. Cause I, I can't imagine how taking the ring off just because. So I imagine the, the United planets have the ring and he's basically, he's stranded. He's, he's stuck in his human role. And you can see what happens next is he hears on the radio that there's somebody in the coast city that's attacking with green lasers. Hal looks at the, his, his truck keys. And he's like, this is the only thing I've got. This is the only tool at my disposal. And he heads off to, to try to make a difference. And I think he's trying to prove it to himself because he yeah. has no purpose. This, this, this is where he starts to get his mojo back. Uh, so he goes there and we see this new character called Steel Fury. We discover that Steel Fury has an outfit that is made from Manhunter armor. And we learned that after another time shift. So, but anyway, he, <laughs> basically this guy's telling Hal there's nothing you can do, which <laughs> that's not the right kind of thing you say to Hal Jordan, right? right. 
Right. And then we, we jump forward. Carol's giving Hal a job. Uh, we think they're flying jets. And these two pilots that Hal's flying with are kind of poking fun at Hal and they're getting under his skin. And so Hal decides, you know, I'm going to show them. And he crashes the plane. And that's when we discover that they're drones. And I thought it was really smart of, of Jeremy Adams to address the whole change. This is a gr another great example of how the world has passed how by because we see this now in in the news and this is a real thing sure. that we're looking more and more at pilotless aircraft mm -hmm. and so that's what they're top trying gun, to do uh, the new top gun uh, yeah introduced talked about that a lot i mean it mm -hmm. makes it relevant because it is true i mean yeah yeah very true and uh he he crashes the jet and then he tries to he tries to lecture Carol about well now that I'm back we can get back to using real planes because you could have had at least an F-14 for the cost of that drone, um, or a bunch of F-14s. And it's a little presumptuous again on his part. He's trying to he's trying to he's trying to go backwards when the world's going forward, and he can't do that. A lot like Maverick was, you know. Yeah, yeah. He has to learn how to live in this new world. And I think that's the character journey that we're going to see. And I'm excited for that. I really am. Uh, you know, as, as much as there's some uncomfortable things here with Hal not fitting in, you've got to show that here. Otherwise you can't get to where you're going. And, and, that, and that, progression. And usually, and we, and we've mentioned this a lot, you know, first issues don't really mean a lot, you know, no, no. but they can make an impression. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it can jumpstart either number one, a feeling towards, a good feeling towards where a storyline might be going or it could be a, a progression of, or it could be a starting point. You were like, okay, I'm not sure what's happening here. You know, it's going to take me two or three more issues to get, you know, acclimated to it. This one here, you can acclimate to pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know, stuff like Grant Morrison takes you about five issues before you're like, now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, and I think th this this first issue is comfortable and uncomfortable at the same time. Yeah. It's familiar, but there's things that are going on that Hal's going to have to learn how to live in a different world, a world that's that's moved by. And and with all respect to Adams, I mean, this is his story he wants to tell too. You know? Yeah. So like at the same time, I'm 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 curious to know what he what he has to bring to the table when it when it in regards to Hal Jordan, mm -hmm. because the last time, I mean, think about it, the last time we saw him written was, I mean, honestly, Grant Morrison's could take on it, mm -hmm. you know? which was a very unique and, and different take as, right. as well. And Venditti before that. So you're, you're looking at, I mean, a lot of history of Hal that can be summed up in, in one person doing it with, with Adams jumping on. And it's, it's not an easy task for anybody to undertake. I would imagine. But yeah. as long as you do your research material, as long as you know, I mean, like, you know how, I mean, it'd, it'd be like if you wrote how, I mean, you know, the character, you, you know, and you would develop him in such a way. Adams is going to be a little bit different than your take too. So, you know, I'm, I'm all for it though. I, 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 I want to see what he does, does with not only Hal Jordan, but his developing role with uh supporting cast. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's interesting to see. And we'll, and we'll see, uh, there's a teaser at the end about the second issue that there's going to be some, some definitely some elements from the past that are going to be revisited. Uh, but after Hal and Carol kind of have a, this little bit of a spar after the crash of the plane, we jump back again to the past. Hal's in the truck. He gets back in the truck and he drives off towards steel fury and plows the truck right into the guy. Uh, and they get into a little bit of a fight. The guy shoots at him and then you see how manifest a ring. I mean, you see it materialize on his hand mm -hmm. that he's taking that, that willpower and ref he's not forging the ring, but he's doing much like he did in the end of the last run where he manifested it on his hand, how he does it. Don't know. Is it a direct connection to the previous series? Couldn't tell you. Uh, that's all elements that are left to be unfolded as we go on. And, and so I think what Adams is doing is he's planting some little seeds that'll pay off later, but in the element of the story, they don't require any more explanation than what we see. I mean, that is true. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're jumping off of somebody else's take on where the rings come from, you know, you could look back and do it as 
to anybody you wanted to. But in this particular case, Powell's been the only one that's had that development nature to be able to, you know, bring it, bring about a ring with willpower. Right. And, and so. I think, you know, one of the things I, and I think we talked about this with Philip Kennedy Johnson, the writers, while the, we all have our opinions on the previous run, the writers are inheriting these toys and this is the journey they've been on. And they're not just going to discard a piece of, of history. Sure. They're going to build on it, which is what we would want them to do. Uh, with both the parts we like and the parts we don't like, build on it, continue to move forward. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, there there are some things that Adams does too that are that are really subtle that I liked. Uh, I don't know about whether or not you picked up on it, but his use of some of his music choices. There are a couple times when there are songs on the radio, and they're very, very fitting. You know, there's a scene in uh, in the beginning. I think my favorite scene in the book is when Hal's by himself, because we see him being very retrospective and introspective. Mm -hmm. And it's something we don't, we don't get to see that. How's the kind of guy who's not going to bear his emotions and he's not going to have those kind of conversations unless they're with himself. So it's perfectly fitting. But when he's there drinking his soda and staring at the view of the heavens, the song uh, don't come around here no more by Tom Petty, the heartbreakers comes on the radio. How appropriate. It is a good song for that particular moment. Yeah, yeah, and there's another song uh, when Hal is driving off towards Co City in the truck, about to, to deal with Steel Fury. Uh, the song comes on from the Rolling Stones. You can't always get what you want. Again, it's a good perfect. song too. Great, great song, but again, perfect choice. And I, and I like how he's kind of alluding to things with that, and he's not being in your face about it. But you know, the issue ends with a fantastic panel. Of Hal saying, you know, take a wild guess when he's asked who he is. Uh, really, really cool. And the the next thing that happens in the next issue is there's a plane explosion and the demolition team strikes and meet Carol's fiance. So demolition team is a set of characters. They're a team that showed up back in the Bronze Age, like during the 80s. So it'll be neat to see them back. Uh, Carol's new fiance is interesting. Is it, do you think it's gonna be a new character or do you think it's gonna be somebody we've seen before? I mean, there was an allusion to it when he said anybody I know and she kind of right. just brushed it off, right? She just didn't acknowledge it. So it's not Kyle Rayner. <laughs> no, oh God, I hope not. Oh God. The, the less said about that, the better. God. <laughs> that was one of the worst, worst things ever. Uh, it was, <laughs> was terrible. Um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't think you'd put that line in there. I don't know. You could take that line in two different ways until you said something sure. about your fiance, right? I mean, it's an innocuous line in itself, but then you add context to it like, oh, okay, well, the writer could have put that in there just as a jab, you know? Sure, sure. I I, I think it will be very interesting. I'm looking forward to that. I'm Just reading this this first issue, I'm, I'm very excited about what we're going to see. I, I think Adams has got the tone. He's got the character. Zermonico's art is just stunning. Good stuff. Uh, the, this book, and, and we'll we'll talk about the John Stewart story here in a minute. But the artwork was fantastic. You know, the, the w- minimal use of splash pages, whether they're there, they're to make an entrance or to drive home something big, which I like because there's more pages of story. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, looking back at this, could you juxtapose this as far as a screenplay goes for setting up a movie? I mean, um, possibly. Even, you could even you could even play those uh, segments of music on the radio when Hal's. Oh sure, off. yeah. I have I have like a, a a few songs that I would I would use, uh, and again I don't want to we talked about this last episode. I don't want to. I have a, I have so many ideas, but I hesitate to say any of them because I think they'd be really cool. But if I say something about them, they won't. They'll never get used. <laughs> or they'll get used. Yeah, or they'll get used, and then they're yeah. And I don't want to go down that road, but. Right. I I'll just give you one. I I see the song back in the saddle again. Oh okay. Um, would be a by Aerosmith would be a great song. Uh, yeah, that would be cool. That would be and that would be a sequence when he's doing some kind of maybe he happens upon a a, a bunch of other core members or something. <laughs> I I always had a scene in my head where <laughs> in an origin story. 
Hal has to get into it. You remember the scene in, in we, we talked about it during the Jeff Johns run where Hal gets into a jet and he doesn't have his ring mm-hmm. and he goes and he goes at the Manhunters and charges his ring on a Manhunter. Right. This in my head, when I read that issue and Hal's getting in the jet, that song plays in my head. Do you need back to find somebody that animate that and then <laughs> the music too? <laughs> um, the, the other song I, I like for Hal is the Authority song by John Cougar Mellencamp. Oh, yeah, I'm not uh, a big I'm not a big Melon Camp fan, but that's, that's no, but that one fits really well. Yeah. But yeah. back back to the issue now. Now I I said I wasn't going to do that, and I did it anyway. <laughs> Bad me. Uh, but this issue just fantastic. I loved it. Uh, maybe you know I could see where some people might think it's a little cringy and how's interactions with Carol, but I think in context of what's going on. I understand it. I, it's not the way I would choose to act. But, you know, Jeremy, he made a good uh, a good reference when we interviewed him. He talked about how he did some irrational things himself in pursuit of, of a woman. Um, and, and I've done things like that. My, I, I think we kind of all have in some ways. Maybe some of us haven't. Maybe some people are much, much better than I am. Some more than others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. But, you, you know, you've, you've done... You know, you do silly things to try to win the attention of the person you're interested in. And sometimes, stupid yeah, stupid things. Yeah, we're human, right? How's human too? Uh, I, I don't think it's a an intentional thing where he's here like, I'm going to try to be overbearing or force myself on anybody. That's not it at all. Hmm. Uh, I think he's, I think Hal is emotionally desperate at, at this point. And getting the ring back certainly helps. And you notice he didn't go and see Carol before he got the ring back. Right. Yeah, I noticed. So was he having kind of, I don't know, a, uh, an emotional, I, I hesitate to say emotional, but an intellectual um, conversation with himself about where is he? You know, he's, he's self-evaluating before he steps forward. And then when he steps forward, He's fully realized. Uh, what what did you think about the shoulderless design going back to the Silver Age original design? I mean, uniform subtleties usually really don't they don't really trigger a lot with me. What triggers me is like, <laughs> and don't take this the wrong way because this has nothing to do with how shoulder pads or his boots or anything like that. But like you know, Superman's trunks, you know. The ridiculous and stupid debate that follows with it. Oh, <laughs> should he have the trunks or not? It's like, oh my God, I can't believe we live in a day and age where people are arguing over which Superman wears underwear is outside or not. <laughs> I mean, I get it. It, it. It's, but I mean, my God, I mean, what? I'm 49 years old, and I look at that that I look at that argument and it and and this whole context and and just take a step back from it and be like, why? Why would that be something that anybody in their right mind should worry about? <laughs> but I will say that to a hardcore fan, I do, I do right. sympathize, but I won't empathize because I can't feel that way about it. Well, it's like the endless debate with Batman. Is is it is it a black cape and cowl or is it blue? I'll I'll one better it. I don't care what they do with Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was I was kind of gaslighting you a little bit there intentionally. <laughs> I mean, you're right. I mean, there's been so many like I remember when Wonder Wonder Woman went through her uniform changes, you know, and and these writers come along and they think they can just, I don't know. I mean, when you have a concept and have an idea in mind, I I usually tend to think that the subtle changes are more attractive to the fan base than it is when you do a full makeover and people just don't like it, you know. Sure. And and how's outfit has changed over the years? You know, it started with the yeah. swim the swim trunk look with the, with the the shoulderless look and then the shoulders came in and i think there for a while it kind of went back and forth there were a couple of other looks that they did there was one time there was a look where the green at the top came to a point in the center and then back out again well almost like an hourglass and what i will say about about the green lantern uniform and in, in its entirety and it doesn't matter who's wearing it they're unique in itself because they've they're all different and regardless of if hip hisses changes no, let's put it like this. It would make sense for his to have subtle changes over the course of time. Being as in your Green Lantern uniform is a manifestation of your own perception, right? I mean, he obviously puts right. it on with the ring. So 
I'd assume that the ring works the same way with every other alien life form out there that wears a ring. And all of those are different. And they're tailored towards their look, too, which is I think it's important. Because some like Mogo would look ridiculous with uh, like a Guy Gardner type of uniform on, you know? <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, the subtle things are I'm okay with. Yeah. Like the shoulders don't bother me. The ring thing, I get you. I, I'll I'll go with you on that one. I I like. I I, I didn't think I'd like it at first, uh, but I think because they kept the point, you know, down in the stomach area, and they didn't do the swim trunk look, I think it looks better that way. Uh, I like the modern take that you know that that comes to the point at the bottom of the front. So to me, I don't mind the shoulders going away. I, at first, I didn't think I'd like it, but I think the Germanic art look, artwork makes it look fine. You know, I it, it jumped out to me as as being different just because you're so familiar to seeing it the one 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 way, but it doesn't look that different. You know, the scene when he arrives with the miners, his arms are out and you don't see it missing anyway. Uh, at the end, you see it, but it's such a beautiful image. I, I'm fine with it. You know, I, I like I said, I thought I was not going to like it. But, well, and that brings up another point. I mean, artist rendering. I mean, if you think about sure. artist rendering, I mean, you could have the greatest uniform in the world and have a crap artist do it, and it just doesn't look good. I mean, right, right. I mean, no offense to artists. I mean, it's all subjective anyway. We all know that now, but right, you know, some things look better on paper while some things just don't. And I don't know, but it, it, in regards to your question, eh, I'm cool with it. I mean. As long as they don't take away from the nature of the Green Lantern stuff, uh, I'm okay with the topical changes. I just if want it to be consistent. Sense. As long as it's consistent, I'm okay. And then there's that, you know, I mean, and again, I guess it's consistent off whoever's writing the character at the time. I don't, I don't know what they would refer to consistency. I, I would assume as long as it's consistent through Adam's run, then right. that's fair, right? I, yeah. Then that makes sense. Keep it the way it is. But the other thing is, is is if Hal shows up in another book, it should look that way too. And we know <laughs> <laughs> that never happens. Anymore. It never happens because nine times out of ten, you you come across somebody's got the white boots going on, and and it just there should be some consistency there. And, and I'm fine if that's the look they're going for. But let's let's jump over to the John Stewart story. I loved how this started out uh, with John's mother. I thought that was really nice. Uh, I love the artwork. Um, Montos does a fantastic job with the facial expressions, just as Germanico does. And the look on her face when she sees John out there, you know, working on her she shed. And uh, it, it it just, it, it made me think about my own mom. Uh, yeah, you that's know? true. But it's interesting. We, we get some, we get some story nuggets thrown in here that, John is back from doing whatever he's doing. We don't know what his status is. That's kind of left up in the air. We know he's not really a Green Lantern anymore, but he's come back to Earth to kind of figure out what's what. And I guess I wonder if he's on Earth at the same time Hal Jordan is. I guess I would assume they are. Well, I'm assuming they are because in the in the very first page. Uh, you can see her in the kitchen, and on the TV is the news story out of Coast City with Hal there. Oh, that's right. That's so the there's a sense of tying it together. Because my first, yeah. my first thought when I read it is, is this really Earth? Is this hype? I don't want to say hyper time, job, John, but the Dark Sector, John. Is this him? Which because you know we have two John Stewarts right now. Mm -hmm. So which John is it? Uh, but this is clearly our John. You you get that from that from that tie in there. So wait a minute. So we have two John Stewarts now. Does that beg the question that I guess you would call Jeff Thorne's John Stewart would be outside of canon right now until he appears? Right. He's he's in the dark sector looking for Cat Matui and doing whatever he's doing, aging at a completely different rate. Uh, but he is another version of John Stewart. There are, there are kind of two Johns. Now, whether they share, at some point, will they, were their memories and things combined? I, you know, who knows what's going to happen with all that. But yes, there is another John Stewart out there. And the reason why Thorne did it that way was that if he ever gets to write the second part, it's all about that other John. 
uh, he Jump can back he, in and say, "Oh, I can just tell a story off of this John that I right, left right. out in the dark sector. He's just been hanging out, chilling with his friends." Yep. But for whatever reason, John is there yep. doing whatever, and uh, this is where he needs to be now. And and if there's any criticism over this piece, and I've heard a few people say this, and I think we had you know we had some listener feedback last episode that John is only really in four pages out of the eight pages that are here because we jump again. Mm-hmm. to another time in another universe and this story you know if you go back and, and again if you watch and listen to the interview with philip kennedy johnson it helps if you read the dark crisis world without a justice league book but you don't have to know that but we see here in another universe that this universe that, that existed in that story that john has his own john is like the superman of this world essentially he's the lead superhero and he has his own version of the Green Lanterns. They have a different oath. We see a version of Guy Gardner and a new character called Shepard. And they are attacked by the Revenant Queen. And this, this all ties back to that story and that the Revenant Queen is likely the mother of, because she talks about her child being killed, is, is the, the, uh, the mother of the Revenants that John killed in that other story. Right. And interesting battle looks cool and basically she's looking for john and if it's not the john that did this it's our john and and, and, and talking to philip kennedy johnson it sounds like the two johns are going to meet up not necessarily the thorn john that we just talked about but this this version of john and our john are going to meet up and the revenant queen is going to be going after our version of john and this all leads into the John, St- John Stewart book that comes out in September, something which we thought was a miniseries, but again, referring back to our interview with Philip Kennedy Johnson, it sounds like DC wants to do more than just the mini, but Johnson is saying, at least as of that last interview, that if that's the case, he probably won't be able to stay with as the writer because he's got too many things on his slate. God, they're going to give it back to Thorne. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> that's a shame too because i would have uh because i was at the comic book store today apotheosis here in st louis and uh i ended up getting uh action comics on my pull list because i want to make sure i start getting that every month every month now and uh, i would have pulled a uh philip kennedy johnson john stewart book i mean yeah the guy's writing i mean we've only got <laughs> what four months until three months or so until that series comes out so I, I'm looking forward to it. I, th- I think they're both good writers. I I think this really sets the stage well. The, uh, very strong in the writing. Both writers are are really writing good stories here. The artwork for both of the Montos, his his artwork is fantastic. Zeratico's artwork is fantastic. To have a book that's that's hitting right in all fronts, right out of the gate, is is so refreshing and exhilarating as a fan. Uh, well, I, you can you can get a sense of the temperament when this book came out. I mm-hmm, mean, mm-hmm. I mean, you you troll enough social media, you get people talk about it enough, you get the hype. And I it, reflectively, I don't think the prior run had the hype it did. This did for the first issue. At least I don't remember that it happened. But it's good that this one is is generating that kind of attention. You know, yes, you are, because you want that. I'm hearing. A lot of I don't want to say universal because I've heard a few, heard a few I've heard a few people say, well, this is just somebody trying to do their version of the John's run. And I, I don't I, know how that's fair to say, but yeah, it, it it's too early to say that. But some people are saying it's a retread. I, I don't feel that way at all. At least looking at the entire picture, certain elements, sure, but I don't think any writer or any comic book person in their life could could ever go into something thinking that there's not going to be some kind of retread along the way i mean sure sure kind of it just get you read you read and write so much stuff i mean you're more often than not you're you're actively writing something and you don't even know you are but it, it just comes out and i didn't i didn't feel any retread with this i felt like a i felt like it's a it's a it's picking up where we don't know where it's left off. I mean, we don't, I mean, we ha- he ended up on earth, but we don't have any questions. Like yeah. we don't have any answers towards anything other than no, like, the stupid no. battery blew up again a, little, a while ago. And yeah, I, I think, it, I think it's too soon to draw those kind of conclusions because it's one issue. 
Yeah. Uh, but but the the only criticisms, like I said, I heard was it's a retread of the Johns run and they're trying too hard to make it look like Top Gun Maverick. I'm like, well. That has some kind of similarities in there, but it's sure because Maverick is Hal Jordan. Yeah, I mean it's kind of hard not you know? to, to draw all that kind of comparison. I mean, sure, you have to be an idiot not to. Right, right. You, you'd <laughs> have to have your head in the sand. So I, I, I get those familiar feelings, but it also feels familiar to Green Lantern. So you know, I, I, those are the only comments I've heard, and those are very few and far between. Uh, most I have not seen a book get this much excitement and positive response right out of the gate in a while well i would imagine and this is just spitball on here but the last year and a half or whatever it's been everybody's been waiting for a hal jordan book i mean sure i mean not to, not no discredit to john stewart i mean he's still popular and i'm still hoping that he gets his own book and i'm still hope that johnson does it or at least somebody worthy can take on the mantle but at the same time you, you can't defeat the purpose fans want a hal jordan book i mean you can sit here and say, yeah, well, I want Joe Moline to be at the front and center. I want Guy Gardner and Kyle Rayner to be at front and center. That's great. That'll last you for a little while until people will start getting get PO'd. Where's Hal? You know, I don't understand why we don't have a Hal book. So it's the same thing with Superman. It's the same thing with Batman. You know, you can't, you can't right. just take that character away and, and people are going to expect, oh, it'll be gone for a little while. Before too long, the, the, the drums start beating. Sure. Where's our guy at? You get the initial bump of people excited by change and then it dies off and it goes back to the way it was. Yeah. The ebb and flow of the comic book world. Sure. Sure. Well, I mean, it's the same thing. You look at, let's look at the character of Jessica Cruz. You know, it started out with, with her, her struggles with anxiety and things were a big part of her character for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> now she's just another Green Lantern. She's no different. And, and that was, again, that was the problem with Kyle. He started out being the new guy, that the, the Peter Parker of the Green Lantern universe, but eventually you can't be the rookie anymore. Mm -hmm. So then where do you take the character? And so they all end up kind of in the same place down the road. Yeah. But things always revert back to the way they, they used to be. They do. They do. I don't know. I mean, Adams, when he, when he talked, he had, he had that, that, Oh, that fanboy giddiness confidence that he's excited for what he's going to do and where he's going to take this. Uh, you can take that for what you want. I mean, you know, I take it as in somebody who's excited that they're going to get to write something like Hal Jordan and Green Lantern because, I mean, I'm a writer. I don't think I could write a comic book, but I'm a writer. And I would be excited if I was taking on a Green Lantern book or any, I'd be excited if I was taking on a Batman book for for crying out loud. Sure, I'd I be mean, excited if I was writing any book. <laughs> it, it's it's funny to to look at some of the things that Adam says. There's there's the self deprecating commentary that he makes. Like he's he's surprised he's yeah. getting the gigs he's getting, but it's it's the quality of the work. And he's certainly familiar with Green Lantern. He wasn't happy to lose the Flash, but he's excited about taking on Green Lantern. He's doing a, from what we can tell after one whole issue, he's doing a great job. I I don't have any reason to suspect it's not going to continue to be like this and good. I I, I just think it's going to be great. Well, I mean, it, it's going to be on my pool every month now. You know. Oh I'll yeah. Collect, I'll collect the runs, so you know, it's my, I don't do that with a lot of runs. You know. Right. Now the Grant Morrison run, I'll do those. I'll do those in collected trades. This one here, I'll do the singles. I'm stupid. I do both. <laughs> I've done that too. I mean, but I don't know. You showed me that cyborg Superman figure when you <laughs> text me today. I'm like, oh, there goes my trades. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My wife, she said, oh, that's nice. So must be the default response. Got, got to come clean. We okay. don't have any listener feedback, but. I messed up when I edited the last episode and I omitted a piece of listener feedback. So we're we're going to jump out and we're going to come back with a complete wardrobe change because they want to play the clip from the last episode where we do the listener feedback. <laughs> Here goes war, wardrobe change. Yeah, gone. Uh, <laughs> so 
we're going to jump out, do this piece of listener feedback that I screwed up and forgot to include in the last episode. And then we'll be back to wrap things up. Green Lanterns, we have listener feedback from Taylor. He has some comments about the upcoming Lantern show on Max. Commencing transmission in 3, 2, 1. Hello, Myron and Phil. First off, I'm a big fan of your podcast. I enjoy listening to your opinions and insights on the Green Lantern section of the DC Comics universe. Something I am looking forward to is the Lanterns TV show, albeit cautiously. For one, I am very excited to see who they cast as Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart since they will be the ones we will see in future movies. In terms of who could play them, I would choose Alden Ehrenreich as Hal Jordan and Yolan Knoll as Jon Stewart. I'd like to see the show explore Hal and Jon's backstory since it would develop the characters well, and the former hasn't been shown much, if at all, since the terrible 2011 dumpster fire. Also, I don't think Jon Stewart will be a Yellow Lantern, because James Gunn has called him a Green Lantern multiple times in press meetings. One character I hope makes it into the show is Carol Ferris, since I think she is a great character, and the show could set her up as Star Sapphire. I also hope that Jessica Cruz appears, because she's my second favorite Green Lantern of Earth, right behind Hal. As for who the villains will be, you may be disappointed to learn that it may not be based on Blackest Night. There is evidence that the writers at DC Studios are adapting DC New Frontier for Chapter 1 of the DCU, and in that story, the villain was the center. Some of the traits of the center that the show might explore are the dinosaurs and the cult of the center. If they ever make a movie after the show, I would probably make that similar to Blackest Night, and save that for Chapter 2. Anyway, those are my thoughts and hopes for the Lantern show and the potential movie. What are yours? Hey Taylor, thanks for the uh, thanks for the words. Uh, let, let, let's uh, deconstruct this a little bit. First off, I'm thrilled and happy that you're a fan, because that's the main point here. But we shall move on. Uh, the television series. Oh gosh, the television series. I mean, the, uh, almost the talk of the television series at this point, uh, wherever they're at in the tele- in the said television series, is almost like, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like it's stuck in a vacuum, <laughs> you know. And there's so many, so much fandom that's just waiting for just a, a morsel or just some tidbit to drop. I mean, because if you've seen lately how they're treating gun i mean they're just i mean they're just railing them hand over fist with about everything they would they, they want to know everything everybody wants to know everything and then it's the same thing with the green lantern series or the green lantern uh television series uh show i i don't think they'll they'll mess it up when they they make their casting i'll put it that way i i think they're going to do justice with it i like who you chose uh with alan enrick and um uh, uh, Yelan Noel as John Stewart. I think those would be two great choices. Um, I, I I think they should choose Young if they're going to do it, um, and that's that's the main point. Um, I would like to see other other people appear, just like you, Carol Ferris um, or whatnot. But um, but yeah, uh, thanks for the words, man. Uh, we we love hearing from people, and we love. Uh, I like the listener feedback part because we we get we get stuff from everywhere, and it, and it's fun. Uh, some of the people that just come out of the woodworks just to send their thoughts. And I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I I really love the listener feedback because A, I know people are paying attention and listening. And I love that they share their thoughts because the whole point of this is to create a community of fans and everybody's got opinions and I, I want to hear them, especially if, if it's different than mine because sometimes it makes me think differently about things. But mm-hmm. both those casting choices are solid. I, I agree with him that I do not see John Stewart being a Yellow Lantern. I know they showed, yeah. when they talked about the show, they showed some artwork from Earth, Earth One Green Lantern and so people started thinking that's what's going to happen. I, I don't see that happening. And gosh, if this show doesn't have Carol Ferris in it, they're doing something wrong. Uh, I, I hope that they they take some time to build the dynamic between Hal and John. I I know if I were King of the forest, I know how I would introduce them and build on that, but I don't even want to say anything like it because if I say anything that's even close to what they're thinking and then they hear this or somebody says something about it and it gets to them, then they can't do it. They'd have to change what they're doing. So I'm not saying anything about what i would do until after they do it then i'll say how i would have done it sure. uh, 
and as to what happens with other Earth lanterns, I don't I don't know when it's going to happen. I I part of me wants to give them time to establish these two characters and build the mythos in the audience's mind because I think that's one of the things that hurt the 2011 movie was that the entire concept of the Green Lantern Corps was thrown on people all at once. And it was just a lot for people to process for us comics fans. It wasn't because we were, this is what we're itching to see. But I think for the, the non fan, the general public, I think that was harder for them. So yeah, I, I don't see them doing Jessica and Simon Baz and guy and Kyle for a while. I really want to see them build up the dynamic between hell and John and build up, in the public's mind, what the Green Lantern Corps means before they transition to doing things on the big screen, because I, you, it's a foregone conclusion that these characters are going to go from both one one medium to the other, because they've talked about how their casting is going to be intentional in that way. Uh, I see that being very much a part of it, because you know one of the things I think I heard Gunn say was that the Green Lantern Corps fra- part of the franchise was very important to what they're going to do. Uh, I know you and I talked about Blackest Night. I, I would love more than anything to see a Blackest Night movie. But the thing is, what gave Blackest Night the 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 pow and the punch was the fact that we had history with these characters that were dead that were suddenly turned into Black Lanterns. And that takes years to build that up. Nobody in the general public is going to know who these characters are. Mm-hmm. And seeing Ralph and Sue Dibney as zombies won't resonate with anybody who doesn't know those characters and what happened to them at that time in 2009 where they were. Sure. So while I would love to see a blackest night thing done, they'd have to really significantly change it. I personally would much rather see an animated version of it first before they tried to even make an attempt to do it with, with live action. Well, live action. That's, that's, a, that's a, I, I mentioned it before that I, I feel like there's some kind of underpinnings to the fact that that might be something they, that they concoct later on down the line and, and there'll be little breadcrumbs left along the way. I guarantee it won't be in the first chapter. It won't be anywhere. And I no. doubt it'd even be in chapter two. And who's even knows how far you make it by then, you know, and where, the, and where the DCU is at, at that point. Right. If, if, so. if guns plans go off well, and we, we'd have to take a few years, a couple phases to establish some of these characters and have them yeah. die. So that so that their turns as Black Lanterns mean something to people. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know as if that's the central focus of where they're going. So I I don't know as if we'll ever see it. To be honest, as much as I would love to, I think we're more likely to get a Sinestro Corps adaptation than we are a Blackest Night one. The yeah, Sinestro Corps War one would be good, yeah. but again, as, as long as you do the slow lead off, and and I like your point about the the character build with Hal and John, because when when you do talk back to the 2011 film, it's like. You know, you know, nobody had a concept of who the Green Lantern core was, let alone Green Lantern the figure. You know, it was just to me, I always felt like that movie was just kind of put out there because it was like, let's just put it out there and and let's hope it does well. Because I didn't feel like there was any oomph behind it. But at the same time, I think a slow burn to a core concept makes more sense in the grand scheme of things, you know, you got Hal and John and what's to say you don't have Hal and John building the core or building the concept of a core. So anyway, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of things that could happen. Um, there is. And, and there has been hints about new frontier kind of being their model for how they get the justice league together. I, and I could fire. get behind that too. I mean, that's, that's fire. That's one of my favorite stories of all time. <clears throat> uh, you know, you, you would have, probably have to take it out of a place in time. I think you and I both have the absolute edition of the new frontier on camera right now. It's, yeah, uh, it's right back there. One of my favorite stories of all time. So it, it really is. And, and and it's, if they do it well on the big screen, I think if, if, if it translates well, I, I think it would translate well, given the time frame that it's in, I think it would be really, really a good a hit for that era. You know, yeah. and I think it would encapsulate a lot. And and, and people like nostalgia. I mean, right. geez, man, look at the Flash movie. It's going to do well just because Keaton's coming back. And, <laughs> You're right. You know? I, I know I'm more interested in seeing the movie for Keaton than I am for the Flash. And I'm not even a Batman fan. Right. I'm not even right. a Batman fan. I'm going to I, see, think, I got a I, Flash shirt on, people. I, I think you're a closet Batman fan. You just don't want to admit it. <laughs> no, you won't see any Batman paraphernalia anywhere. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> But at the same time, he shows up in all my life. So I can't really just ignore the guy. I mean, right. I get it. He's popular. 
but he's still going to have to suffer the brunt of my jokes. <laughs> and for all you Batman fans out there, I've heard them all. I don't care. You all know you got it well because Batman is is feeding your pure frenzy of your fandom height. I get it. And, and you know what? I applaud you for that. That still doesn't mean I'm not bitter and upset about it because I want more Green Lantern stuff. So at least give me that, Batman fans. <laughs> <laughs> well, Taylor, thank you so much for reaching out. Uh, right on, and- Tyler. We hope to hear from you again soon. You can become a part of the show by leaving a message up to one minute long on our voicemail line. Call us at 406 Pod of OA. That's 406 763 6362. You can also email us at podcast at block of OA.com. We'd love to hear from you. All right. Welcome back, fellow Owens. Myron, here we are. We're starting off on an exciting note. We've got the new book new blood uh it's like re- reinvigorating energy i can just feel it man it's gonna be a fun ride this year yeah yeah i'm excited i'm excited for what's to come so uh we we have we'll be doing another issue because obviously the second issue comes out here in a week or so we'll be doing that but then we're doing another event it's going to be the lantern cast is leading the charge lantern cast and ourselves and i believe it's going to be donnie's uh, video show. I, I don't remember the name of his his show. Emerald Echo. Emerald Enthusiast. Yeah, yeah. It, that's his handle. But I think they, I think it's the Emerald Echo podcast is what they right. call it. But we're going to be doing uh, an event. Uh, I don't want to get into the the whole what the books are yet because I, I, that's the Lantern Cast. It's their idea. Uh, I would rather let them announce it and and not do that ourselves. But we've been co- jokingly calling it GL June. Don't know if that's what it's going to be officially called or not, but we'll see. Uh, but uh, I'm excited to do that episode as well. So we're going to have two more episodes this month. One will be our jail June episode and one will be the review of Green Lantern number two. I know I'm excited to read it too. I can't wait. That'll be uh, next week. That comes out next week, right? Yeah, I think it comes out next week. So depending on, on when we decide to do the GL June event, we'll either the next episode will either be Green Lantern number two or GL June. I, I'm excited about the GL June thing. Uh, if only because these are books that I actually haven't read yet. So <laughs> I'd have to say, I don't think I've read this before either. And if I have, I've completely forgotten it off my database. Yeah. So Which if happens. anybody who knows me knows that this, that means it's a Cal Rayner era book. Cause that's when I jumped out. <laughs> so yes, they're making me read Cal Rayner books, oh. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. It should be fun. It should be fun. He's not too bad. He's not Simon Baz bad. I don't think anybody's Simon Baz bad. <laughs> <laughs> but all right my friends well thanks again for joining us for another episode hope you enjoyed it i hope you got something out of it if you haven't picked up this book this first issue uh what are you waiting for because definitely pick it up and read it. It, it it was definitely enjoyable or if you're one of those that likes to wait for the trades do that too or do both or or do with do like me and do both yeah uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I buy the floppies, box them up after I get done, and I wait for the trades. And when I'm going to reread it, I read the trades. It's just, the, <laughs> just the way it is. That's a true fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or a glutton for punishment. But anyway, until next time, treat each other well, keep your power ring charged, and make every day your brightest day. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much for watching this Green Lantern video from the blog of OA. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find even more great Green Lantern videos, reviews, podcasts, and more at our main website, www.blogofoa.com. So until next time, keep your power ring charged and make every day your brightest day.